Okay, friends. Whoa, that's just a little loud. Sorry about that. Uh, today, we're going to spend uh, maybe 10 minutes on this last kind of acid base chemistry that I want you to be good at. This is important for biochemistry. It's important if you're going to go work in a biochem or biology lab someday and think about biomolecules. Uh, the situation is this. You have a protein, a nucleic acid, some kind of biological molecule, and you're going to dissolve it in aqueous solution. In general, the concentration of molecules like proteins, any given individual protein inside the cell is in the micromolar range. Uh, that's what that letter there is. That's the Greek letter micro. That means 10 to the minus 6. Uh, whereas buffers in the cell or in a biochemical experiment are in the millimolar to hundreds of millimolar range. When you're in that situation, the pH of your, of your solution influences the protonation state of your biomolecule and not the other way around. Uh, you, with this Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which we derived last time, You've used that in general chemistry before under situations where the concentration of the molecule you were dissolving influenced the pH of the solution. But in most biological applications, in your cells and in your blood, the pH is held constant. It better be uh, or else you can't live. So uh, we want to be able to deal with the situation where we consider the pH is constant and then ask, what happens to the biomolecule that we're adding to the solution. And in general, in problems like this, I'm going to draw some crazy structure, and I'm going to draw the molecule as it would appear if it were neutral. And that's going to be a challenge for you because you're going to have to be able to identify not only groups that uh, are neutral acids and have negatively charged <laughs> conjugate bases, but also potentially groups that are neutral conjugate bases of positively charged acids. Here are just a few examples of things you might find in a biological macromolecule. Um, and these are not, uh, this is not comprehensive. Of course, anything I give you would be on a pKa table. Uh, except for the ones that you have to memorize. Uh, but in any case, uh, here is this molecule that's neutral, and I ask, what happens to it when you put it in a uh, buffered aqueous solution at, say, a pH of 7, or suppose a pH of 2? Uh, to figure this out, you need to understand the principle that we figured out last time, which is that for a given acidic group, the difference between pKa and pH tells you whether the conjugate acid form should dominate or the conjugate base form should dominate. If the pKa of an acid is greater than the pH, this number is positive. The log if, of a ratio, if the log of a ratio is positive, that means the ratio is greater than one, so the concentration of acid is higher. Properties of logarithms. Can you accept that? You maybe need to noodle on that for a while to make sure you get it. If pKa is greater than pH, or if the pH is less than the pKa of a given acid, then that acid still has its proton. If pH is greater than pKa, this number's negative. The, if the log of a ratio is negative, that means the ratio is less than 1, which would tell you the conjugate base form dominates. Or, if pH is greater than pKa, the acid loses its proton. So, what we have to do is go through very carefully and identify all of the neutral acids that, are, uh, that have negatively charged conjugate bases, and then identify all of the neutral groups here that have positively charged conjugate acids. And we'll see some of them uh, have both. So, for example, this group is a carboxylic acid. If I were to look up the pKa in a table, and you should practice that, we don't have time for that right now, I would find that the pKa of this group is 4. Okay? Now, suppose the problem tells me 
that the pH is, I'm going to use, mm, no, that's fine. Suppose the problem tells me that pH equals 7. Let's figure out, and, and let's, actually let's draw the conjugate base of this group. We can see the conjugate base would be negatively charged. This is HA. This is A minus. So which form dominates a pH 7? Well, you tell me. Can you do the math in your head? 4 is less than 7, or 7 is greater than 4. So which form dominates, acid or base? Base form dominates, right. When pH is greater than pKa, the acid loses its proton. Some of you will like words better than equations. That's fine. All right. Um, so, yes, at pH 7, this group, this carboxylic acid, should actually be in its negatively charged form. And the way I'm going to ask this question is, what is the total charge on this molecule at pH 7? So you've got to do this for each and every one of these acidic groups. Okay? Uh, let's look at the next group, which happens to be a thiol. This has a pKa of 8. So we can draw its conjugate base, which is the negatively charged thiol 8. You tell me which form dominates at pH 7. Neutral acid form. Okay, good. And so you can go on uh, this alcohol. So it might be useful actually with the alcohol to realize that um, the alcohol itself is the neutral conjugate base of a positively charged oxonium ion and that pKa is minus 2 but it's also good to realize that the alcohol itself is, the, is a neutral acid for a negatively charged conjugate base, and that pKa, sorry, we're using blue for pKa's, is 16. Those are the two I want you to memorize, by the way. Okay. So, when you have a particular group that has multiple protonation states, you simply compare them one by one with the pH to tell you what is the dominant form. So, pKa is minus 2, pH is 7. Is there going to be any of the positively charged oxonium ion present? Okay, go back up to your equation. If pH is greater than pKa, right, there can't be any of this form. Then we're going to do the same thing for the next equilibrium. pH is 7, the pKa here is 16. Which form dominates? Negatively charged base or neutral acid? Neutral acid. You see what we did there? We went one by one. We said there can't be any of the positively charged acid. And then we said, can there be any of the negatively charged conjugate base here? No, this is the form that dominates. We're not doing any complicated polyprotic equilibria equations. We're just doing the comparison one by one. I saw a hand. Did I miss a question? Go ahead. So is it PKA minus 2 or 16? PKA is negative. Well, yes. It's which one are you talking about? 16 is for neutral acid to negatively charged base. Minus 2 is for positively charged oxonium ion, ROH2+, to neutral alcohol. So you're dealing with, I drew you the neutral alcohol, but you should be aware that there are two alternative protonation states. You've got, in addition to the alcohol, you have its conjugate acid, the oxonium ion, and then you also have the conjugate base of the alcohol, the alkoxide. So you've got two possible things. You want to consider both of them. All right? Um, let's see. I will leave the next uh, one to you. I'll just tell you, if you look that up, the pKa uh, if you look that up in a pKa table, the pKa is 10. Here's the negatively charged conjugate base. 
uh, we won't decide whether that one's positive, or neutral, or negatively charged. We'll just uh, leave that to you. I want to talk about the amine because I realize that even though I'm talking about it now, some of you are unfortunately going to get this wrong. So I'm going to try to warn you. Like the alcohol above, the amine is a neutral acid, and it's also a, a, uh, it's a neutral acid with a negatively charged conjugate base, which would be NH minus. This is the amide or amide. This is the amine. But the neutral amine is itself the conjugate base for the positively charged ammonium ion, RNH3+. Do you see the analogy to what we did before? Oxonium, alcohol, alkoxide, ammonium, amine, amide. Same sort of situations. So you've got basically a polyprotic acid and you need to consider both steps. Which form dominates uh, among positively charged ammonium versus neutral amine, uh, and then uh, also considering the negatively charged amide. So to do this, we look up the appropriate pKa's. This is something people get wrong all the time. First of all, the first thing they get wrong is they forget. They look at the neutral amine, and they are, they are able to think about this equilibrium going to negatively charged conjugate base, but they forget that the amine is a neutral conjugate base of a positively charged acid. Don't do that. Um, if only it were as easy as saying, but you may need to practice until uh, you're able to see that. Looking at, and then the other mistake people make is they look at the pKa table and they use the wrong pKa for the situation they're in. So neutral amine to negatively charged amide, that pKa is not 11, it's 38. 11 versus 38 is a big difference. You can see how you might make some wrong conclusions if you mix that up. Positively charged ammonium to neutral amine is pKa of 11. So uh, let's go through this again one by one comparing what we said was the pH in the problem, pH 7. I might not, have, I might not write it as 7. I might write it as um, 2 or 5 or whatever. Uh, but let's ask the question, at pH 7, should there be any of the negatively charged amide? Using your, we can copy this equation down if it's helpful. pKa is 38, pH is 7. So is there any of the negatively charged amide? No. Okay. And we're not done. We've just established that we can rule out the negatively charged amide, but we haven't yet. We are not yet able to conclude that the neutral form dominates because we haven't considered this step. You've got to consider both of them. So let's do the same consideration here. 11. PKA of 11 for positively charged ammonium to neutral amine. Should there be any neutral amine or should there be, should there be 100, should there be neutral amine or positively charged ammonium? You make the decision. Oh, we've got a controversy. Some of you are saying neutral amine. Some of you are saying ammonium ion. Let's reason through it. Um, if you want, we can reformulate the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation simply to say this, um, in this case we have a positively charged acid and a neutral conjugate base. <laughs> uh, some people don't like that, some people would prefer this, that's okay. Uh, both forms are equivalent. Now let's look at this again. 11 is for going from, from positively charged acid to neutral amine. 11 minus 7 is a positive number, so which form dominates? Some of you are still saying neutral amine, and it's not. It's the positively charged acid. If, okay, so we need to work on that. Why is it the positively charged acid? 
Go yeah. ahead. So it's both, all of these are like equilibrium reactions so they could go either way. Right. Um, Right. Right. So if I had drawn, and some of you will, would have gotten this right, if I had drawn for you this molecule and I had put the positively charged ammonium on there to begin with. Some of you would have gotten that right because then you would have said pKa of 11. Uh, okay, that, and then, then you would have seen that one doesn't lose its proton because you're okay thinking forwards. You've got to be able to think backwards too. Remember, we're putting this neutral molecule in buffered aqueous solution. The pH of the solution determines what happens to a group. Does it lose a proton? Does it gain a proton? Yeah? Is it possible to use that? The question was, do you have to use this one or this one? In my mind, these are equivalent. I think perhaps some of you are taking the equation too literally. I think you're getting tripped up in the fact that we wrote the equation with a neutral acid and a negatively charged conjugate base. I'm asking you to relax your eyes and just say acid and conjugate base. And in fact, if you want to, we can rewrite this as acid and conjugate base. That makes sense? Yeah. Could you, if you started with ammonium, could you go back to get the amine? Yes, if the pH is greater than 11. Yes. Um, so for here, well, um, there's no, because this is already the positively charged ammonium ion, we're already as protonated as we can get. There's no backward step. You could go to the neutral amine and then you could go to the negatively charged amide and the pKa's would be 11 and 38 respectively. Yeah. So. Multiple, this, you can see how tricky this is, right? You can get wrong which pKa to use. and You can forget entirely about the fact that the amine has a negatively charged conjugate base and a positively charged conjugate acid. And then you can forget if it's given, if, if it started here, uh, if, we, if you start here with the amine, you can forget that you have to worry, does it lose a proton or does it gain a proton? All right, and then, and then perhaps even more insidious is the fact that you look at this henderson hasselbach equation and you're thinking already neutral acid negatively charged conjugate base and you're not seeing that you can apply this also to positively charged acids and neutral conjugate bases. So, you know, it's possible you want to do this and just use words. Um, not sure. All right, yes. Right, so if you're asked what's the total charge on this molecule, you're gonna do this as I've shown you one by one, each acidic group, make the decision which form dominates, and then you'll go through after the fact and say, okay, I have one negative charge there, I have one positive charge there, and then you can make the decision. Okay, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, so that's a good question. You're thinking about uh, this one. That pKa is also minus two. So it's, um, you'll see that with the amines, the pKa's are such that you do have to worry about the positively charged form at pHs near physiological. With alcohols, the pKa of the positively charged thing is so low that you really don't have to worry about it as a dominant form. Good. Um, lastly, we don't have time to go through this in any detail, but I will tell you um, that uh, on the pKa table, you would find 
uh, not, this one is actually not a very good acid. The pKa of this proton is high enough so as to not be relevant uh, at physiological pH, and so I don't put it on the table. But uh, this neutral molecule does have a positively charged conjugate acid, and its pKa is 6. Uh, so I'll, I'll have you go through, and you can, you can work on this on your own until you get it right. I will tell you that at physiological pH, the net charge on this molecule, as I've drawn it, is zero. Um, but you should go through and work out that example until you're convinced that that's right. Um, I will also tell you for fun that if you want to switch the pH to two, that the charge is plus two. Okay, so that we need to sort of be done with acid-base chemistry, but that's worth some practice. Okay, you don't want to be done with acid-base chemistry. That is fine. Go ahead. No, actually, you first. Oh, I, okay, right. Um, what I mean to communicate by this, the squiggly line there, I should have explained that. Uh, I'm drawing the, the um, positively charged conjugate acid of this group as it would appear, but I don't want to redraw the whole biomolecule. So the squiggly line just means that's attached to something else. Is that, yeah, yeah? okay, go ahead. Oh, good. So, um, yeah, there, do you know how in English we sometimes have words that sound the same and sometimes are even spelled the same but have different uses? Chemists are bad that way. There's not too many of these, but the negatively charged amide group, uh, that's, that's the word people use for it, but this functional group that I'm just drawing here. Uh, if you've done some stuff in chapter three, you know that this functional group is also called an amide. And yes, that is true. They are different. They, for whatever reason, chemists use the same word, and I am sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, you're putting the neutral molecule in solution and you're, you're uh, seeing what forms dominate at which pH. The, go ahead. The charge, what does the charge have to do with it? The charge is how I assess whether you know which form dominates because some of these, if they're in their conjugate base form, will be negatively charged, right? And some of them will be positively charged. So this is an easy way on a multiple choice test for me to have you for me to assess really quickly, did you get all of them right, if you get the right charge. This matters, by the way, there are some subcellular compartments like the lysosome, which have really low pH, and this changes the protein folding inside and, and causes different things to happen. Yeah? Yep. Right, the charge is just formal charge on the group. The ammonium is positive, the carboxylate's negative. Yep, yes? That's right, check your answer. The charges you have on each of these groups should add up to the total net charge on the molecule. Net just means total, uh, sorry. I mean, we could say total, whatever. Yeah, add up the formal charges on each of the, each of the groups. Okay, practice that. I guarantee you, you will see a question on it on the exam. Uh, probably it's gonna scare you and probably there's two questions, maybe three, about uh, change the pH, see what the charge is. So you have been warned. Please make sure you can do it. All right, um, so chapter three. Uh, chapter three is a couple of things. Uh, so let's get the first one out of the way. Um, Let's talk about nomenclature of organic compounds. Uh, just a quick point. 
The Smith text approaches organic compound nomenclature, or how we name organic compounds, piecemeal. Uh, each chapter has a different class of organic molecules, and there will be a subsection of each chapter that says, here's how you name it. Um, and that's a fine approach. Uh, naming of organic compounds is important, but not that important. What do I mean by that? Well, you need to know enough that when I talk about things in class, you're not like I have no idea what uh, molecule you're even talking about. You've seen some of that earlier today as we talked about ammonium and amine or alkoxide and alcohol. You're going to pick up some of this just by experience. Uh, the other important aspect of nomenclature is just that when you talk about an organic molecule, the way you talk and write about it needs to specify the structure of that organic molecule unambiguously so that everybody's on the same page. Now, that sounds pretty important for the scientific community. Uh, the problem is that um, no matter how complicated the rules are, you can always draw a more complicated molecule that requires you to invent more rules. And at some point, the system becomes unwieldy, clunky, and pointless. Like when the name of a molecule is several lines long, nobody's going to use it. And in fact, if you look at the papers of most uh, most papers in organic chemistry today will use nomen proper nomenclature to describe specific features of a molecule. But when a molecule is big and disgusting like that, and I haven't even drawn all the atoms in that molecule, we will simply call that compound one. And then we will refer to it in the paper as compound one. In other words, you draw the structure <laughs> and then you refer, to, you refer back to it. Um, so, I just want you to know that going into it because I'm going to teach you enough rules so that you can talk about molecules sensibly, but you're always going to be able to ask me, well, how about this molecule? And at some point I'm going to say, I don't know, and also I don't care. So please try to avoid spending unnecessary time delving because I know that some of you uh, have this mixture of I don't know what it's called, futuristic FOMO slash anxiety slash what if cycles that you get in where you think, well, what if it was this and will I still be able to handle it? No, don't, don't worry about that for nomenclature. You will easily be able to draw a molecule that you don't know how to name and that's okay, all right? I just want you to be able to do things at the level that they are listed in the study guide and in the practice exam. Now. Those rules are pretty straightforward, and so I'm not going to summarize them in class. I'm going to leave it to you to sort of figure it out. I will just give you maybe five minutes on this subject, and then I want to talk about some other things for Chapter 3. Um, a name in an organic molecule has a prefix, it has a root, and it has a suffix, okay? There are key pieces of information that each portion tells you. The suffix tells you what the highest priority functional group is. Chapter 3 uh, and the study guide to chapter 3 will introduce you to what the concept of a functional group is. As an example, a functional group is a group of atoms that typically go together and have specific and similar properties. So for example, this is a carboxylic acid. You've seen some of these before just by dealing with pH, I'm sorry, with pKa stuff. The squiggly line represents other portions of the molecule that we're not saying. This is an alcohol. There are others. I'm going to rely on you to look at them and um, know what they are called. Um, this type of functional group is called an amide. This one is a ketone. Uh, this one is an aldehyde. So the highest priority functional group is going to be specified in the suffix. Um, the root is going to tell you the number of carbons in the longest chain 
that contains the so-called highest priority functional group. By the way, what do we mean by priority? Somebody simply ranked them in a list. There is, it's not just an arbitrary list, there's a reason why they're ranked that way. And we can talk about that reason perhaps if you're interested in office hours, it's not actually that interesting. Um, but there is just a list of uh, functional groups and the ones that are further up on the list are the ones that determine the, the suffix. Root tells you number of carbons in the longest chain that contains that highest priority functional group. The root also tells you are there any pi bonds and if so, where are they? And then the prefix tells you the location, number, and identity of other functional groups. Okay, so uh, as an example, let me give you, because some of this is best <coughs> rather than learning the rules and talking about them exhaustively, some of this is best done just with an example. Okay, so um, in this molecule, it's pretty easy if I look at it. The highest priority functional group is the carboxylic acid. You should be good at recognizing those functional groups. Um, the second thing I do is I identify the longest chain that contains that highest priority functional group. And I start numbering that chain with one at the highest priority functional group if it's like a carboxylic acid. Um, put an asterisk by the ketone because the numbering is a little bit different than the ketone. Unlike a lot of other functional groups, the ketone can be in the middle of the chain instead of at the end of the chain. But um, one, two, three, four, five. Here I'm at a branch point. I'm going to continue, I could number down here or up here. I'm going to continue with up here because this is the longest chain, okay? So, based on that, my suffix for a carboxylic acid is oic acid. <laughs> So I'm going to tack oic on the end of the root to get the name of my molecule. All right, so you got oic acid for the carboxylic acid. There are eight carbons in the root. So there are eight carbons in the chain that contains the highest priority functional groups. So the root is going to have the um, oct in it. Now, uh, the, the root has two parts. One says the number, and the second part tells you where the double bonds are. If there are no double bonds, it's ain. The root ends in ain. So that's if it's, there are just, uh, it's just a hydrocarbon with no double bonds. Uh, if it's got uh, only double bonds, or rather, if there is one or more double bond, it's the, the, uh, so the second part of the root is ene. And if there is uh, a triple bond, one or more triple bonds, the root is ene. Some of you just said in your brain, what if you have both a double bond and a triple bond? In that case, you would have both ene and ene in the root. I told you you didn't want to know. There is a rule for that, and you don't want to know it. Okay, so um, the second part of the root is going to be ene. Now, if I just say octene, all you know is that there's a double bond somewhere in that chain. I need to know where it is. Yeah? Thank you. That's triple bond, not terabyte. Okay, uh, I need to say where the double bond is. So, 
I'm going to use the numbers, right? I started numbering my longest chain in such a way that the highest priority functional group has the lowest number possible. So that's number one, right? Here, where is the double bond? Well, it's between four and five. The rule is I choose the lowest of those two numbers. I only need one of those numbers because uh, if I assume, if the rule is that the, you give the double bond the, the lowest of the two numbers, then everybody knows what the second atom is, right? So we're gonna call that four ene. Oops. Oct. And we'll use dashes to separate numbers from letters. Oct for ene. There's probably a rule for when you use dashes and when you don't. When you don't, I don't care. Don't care what it is. Uh, so if we wanted to add the root to the suffix, put those together, what we would see is we would call this octi, oct for ene oic acid. If you have two vowel, I don't know, uh, there is a rule for when you drop the E off the ene. I also don't care what that rule is. There is a rule for whether or not you need a space be or a dash between the ene and the oic acid. I also don't care what that is. Understand that this is going to be multiple choice type questions, so it'll... Uh, it'll be pretty easy to tease out those issues. And in any case, I'm not gonna give you two answers that look like this and ask you to pick uh, which one is right. Uh, those are minor semantic issues that I don't care about. All right, uh, let's deal with the prefix because we haven't said anything about what this group is that's hanging off the main chain. Prefix says location. So for this, the group that's hanging off the main chain is off carbon five, so we're gonna put five there. And then it's a simple two carbon chain. That's an, that's an ethyl group. You will learn that from the study guide. So we would call this five ethyl for octene oic acid. Now, we're not done because of the double bond. All right, uh, because I told you when we first learned about double bonds that you can't rotate around them. And what that means is the alternative molecule I'm gonna draw here is not the same thing The one on the left is not the same thing as the one on the right. These are isomers, uh, but they're not the kind of isomer you've dealt with before. Isomers you've seen before, well, actually, no, you did talk about stereoisomers in general chemistry. Uh, most often when you hear the word isomer, you think, oh, same molecular formula, but different molecules, different connectivity. These isomers have the same formula and they actually have the same connectivity. Everything's arranged in the same way, but they have different 3D shapes. Notice that in the molecule on the left, the ethyl group is on the opposite side of the double bond as the, this larger group. Or, in other, or the ethyl group is on the same side of the double bond as the hydrogen. Notice in the isomer to the right, the ethyl group is opposite the hydrogen. So those are called stereoisomers. Stereo is for 3D. They differ in shape. We have to have a way of talking about how they differ in shape. Now, I'm hearing some of you whisper to yourself, oh, I know that, that's cis and trans, right? You've heard of, have you heard those terms before? Cis double bonds, trans double bonds. If a double bond has only one non-hydrogen thing on either side, we call that a di-substituted alkene because you've swapped out two hydrogens from just a regular alkene for something that's not hydrogen. 
These are called disubstituted alkenes. And uh, it's easy to talk about their shape because you're only dealing with two things. You're only talking about two different things. So when you say the alkene on top is trans, the alkene on the bottom is cis, that's easy. Everybody knows what you're talking about. But cis and trans are relative terms only and they stop being useful once you start having an alkene that like this that has three things attached. Okay? So what we're going to do now is learn how to talk about alkene stereoisomers beyond cis and trans. There is a rule for that and I do want you to know this rule. And there are going to be questions on your exam about how to talk about alkenes that, are, that have three or more things attached. Okay, so, uh, so buckle up because we're going to go through this, but you're going to need to do a lot of examples uh, on your own to make sure you get it. There should be some in the study guide, and if you struggle with it, your TAs can help you in the recitation section, and I can help you in office hours. Let's take the alkene that we drew, and let's sort of zoom in on it. Do you remember how when we were naming this molecule, we had to decide what the highest priority functional group was? And that that was based on a table or a set of rules that the people that make up these rules, the International Union on Pure and Applied Chemistry, IUPAC, decided. Um, I imagine those meetings must be absolutely riveting. So, uh, I will take you through the rules for an alkene, but like before when we had to identify a highest priority functional group, we're going to have to identify a highest priority substituent on carbon A and a highest priority substituent on carbon B. So for the moment, I like to imagine dividing the double bond in half and the first thing I'm going to do is say, of the two groups on carbon A, which one is highest priority? So this is a consideration between that carbon and that hydrogen. Now, here are the rules for ranking priority groups. We do not have rules, we do not have written rules for ranking priority people, right? And any rules that are unwritten about ranking priority people are not part of the gospel. I want you to understand that. But unfortunately, there are rules for ranking atoms. And uh, here they are. The first rule that you ask is, it's an atom by atom comparison of atomic weight, okay? Or atomic number. I guess atomic weight is what I'm looking, looking for. Carbon is heavier than hydrogen. Please do not misunderstand me. It is not a comparison of the weight of the whole group here versus the whole group there. That would be too complicated and would require too much math and we are not interested in calculators, right? It's a simple, carbon is heavier than hydrogen, therefore carbon wins and is the highest priority functional group, all right? So I'm gonna highlight the carbon in pink. And again, we are not saying anything about the intrinsic eternal value of carbon versus hydrogen. It is simply carbon is heavier, so that's the one that's the highest priority group. Now. Uh, we got an interesting situation with carbon B. I'm sorry, on the other side of the double bond, because if we look at the two atoms that are attached to carbon B, they are both carbon. Carbon versus carbon. It is a tie. So we have a tiebreaker procedure. And the tiebreaker procedure is we write down everything each carbon is bonded to. Do you see how on the top, this carbon is bonded to two other carbons? So I'm going to write those down. I'm going to write it down in order of weight. And then it's bonded to two hydrogens, which are implied but not shown. It may help you uh, to draw those in. I'm not going to do so right now. 
carbon on the bottom is bonded to two other carbons and two hydrogens. Do you see that? One carbon, two carbons, and then two hydrogens that are implied but not shown. The tiebreaker procedure is for me to go down the list, atom by atom, and ask which one's heavier. Well, I can't make a determination there because it's a tie, so I go to the next atom on the list. Similarly, can't make a determination. Next atom on the list, still a tie. Next atom on the list, still a tie. Whatever shall we do? Really riveting, but there are rules for this and you need to know them. Well, we simply move down the chain. One atom out. And then we repeat. Now, uh, let's see. So, now we ask the same question of this carbon here. Uh, you know what, there's too many red arrows. Dot, 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 moving, no, the dots are gonna confuse you too. All right, well, we move one atom out. We'll just leave it there. Carbon versus carbon. Again, it's a tie. So exciting. So now the tiebreaker procedure, we write down what these things are bonded to. The one up top is bonded to two other carbons and two hydrogens. The one on the bottom is only bonded once to carbon and three times to hydrogen. Do you see where this is going? Atom by atom comparison, uh, there was a tie, so carbon versus carbon is a tie. Finally, in like the third round of the second tiebreaker, we determine carbon versus hydrogen. Carbon wins. Yay, so yes, so, so happy. Woo, that means this is the highest priority substituent. Now, um, if you don't want to do this, it's too bad because there will be some amount of points on the exam that will rely on you doing this. If you want to check your work, there's a program that's called ChemDraw that you can uh, download through BYU software, uh, and I think all BYU students can get it, uh, but you can actually draw a structure and then have it tell you the name and it will tell you these things. So, having, prior, having established priority, then we simply ask, are the two pink groups on the same side or opposite sides of the double bond? If the two pink groups are on the same side, the designation we give this double bond uh, for, to describe the shape is gonna go at the front of the name, it's gonna be in parentheses, and it's gonna be one of two letters. It's gonna be either Z, and if it were opposite, it would be E. These are the first letters of two German words, which I will not attempt to pronounce, uh, that mean together and opposite, respectively. Um, if, you have a, if you have a hard time remembering, uh, Z is for things that are on the same side of the double bond. I didn't actually come up with that. That was, a, that was a, one of my students 10 years ago. Uh, opposite side, I don't know, E, opposite ends in E, but then so does same, so I don't know what you're gonna do there. Um, we would call this a Z double bond, and so the correct and full name of, sorry, I'm just, as I said that, I suddenly thought about President Nelson encouraging us to use the correct and full name of the church. <laughs> The correct and full name, which I fully support, the correct and full name of this molecule is Z-5-ethyl-octforienoic acid. If you want, you can put a four there to indicate which double bond you're talking about. It's not needed here because the molecule only has one double bond. Yeah? Why can't we use cis Why can't we use cis and trans? Because cis and trans are relative terms. If I said cis, you would have to decide what I was talking about. E and Z come with those priority rules preloaded into the discussion. All right, thanks friends, we'll see you on Friday.